Hi everyone, I'm Taylor Hudak with Activism Munich and welcome back to another Julian Assange case update. I'm in London outside the Old Bailey Courthouse and joining me to speak about today's court proceedings is journalist and head of investigation with Declassified UK, Matt Kennard. Matt, thank you for speaking with me. Now before we get into your investigative journalism, I just wanted your perspective on what took place in court today. Yeah, I think first it's worth mentioning uh, the conditions with, within which this uh, hearing is being held. Now, this is my first day here at the Old Bailey and I got into the public gallery because a, a, a nice activist allowed me to take their place. They'd been queuing since early in the morning. Um, and you're not allowed to take your phone or your computer in, i.e. there's no place to even store them. So you have to give it to an activist outside. You have to go up six flights of stairs. You sit in a empty um, courtroom except for a few journalists at the bottom but we're in the viewing gallery you and to look at a screen which is kind of like uh, 20 foot away from you with air vents just pumping out cold air so you're freezing cold it, it, it felt I mean shocking to be honest with you because I had heard reports about how difficult it was to access this case but sitting in the public gallery I was shocked that this is the in, in one of the maybe the most important press freedom case in history this is the conditions within which people who want to see it um, have to sit and 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 I mean well, the whole point about justice is it, is it has to be seen to be done so we should have a transparent process around the case but it doesn't seem to be happening in terms of what I saw today um, it was um, about Assange's mental health again uh, and the risk of suicide if he is extradited to the United States and I think that it's quite clear there's a consensus that he has had um, uh, thoughts of suicide for a long time uh, and he's and, and as the final witness said is always related to extradition to the United States she said he was always said to her if I'm extradited to the United States I will commit suicide so I mean there's no two ways about that in that sense and as usual the prosecution um, the US prosecution lawyer Mark Lewis his his tactic is just to impugn the reputation and the expertise of the witness rather than actually try and get any information out now I don't think that's that's a very effective way to, to go about the case because the evidence uh, is, is so clearly in Assange's favour. But as I've said before, in this case, we don't know because although I'm optimistic about um, the fact that what's happening in the courtroom is really showing the political nature of the case and, and the risk to Assange, we, don't, we aren't aware of the context of, what, of, of the, the British legal system and, and, and what's going on in the US as well. And there are forces at play that we don't know about it. I won't speculate because I don't want to be conspiratorial, but there are definitely this is this case has been from the start irregular um, in to, uh, when you put it in the context of other normal criminal cases. Now, many are wondering if Assange is actually receiving a fair hearing. You have done a number of investigations specifically on this judge, Judge Vanessa Baratzer, as well as Lady Arbuthnot. Can you speak to your work with that? Yeah, so we looked initially at um, the history uh, and the, the network of Lady Arbuthnot, who's Westminster Chief Magistrate, who's the most senior judge in, in Westminster. Um, and she oversees her junior judges, including Vanessa Baretza. And she actually ruled on the case. Uh, she made two key rulings in February 2018, um, which upheld his um, bail uh, violation conviction, which the lawyers were trying to get taken away because then it would be easier to negotiate safe passage to Ecuador. So she, she's been a player previously in terms of actual rulings in the courtroom, but is still a player because she oversees her junior judges, including Baretza. And she is deeply embedded in terms of her family links to the British military establishment and also the US military and intelligence establishment. So the first story we did was about her husband, who's Lord Arbuthnot, a former conservative def defense minister, um, who uh, was a director of a company alongside the ex-head um, of MI6, Sir John Scarlett. Um, he's been um, closely uh, working with the Henry Jackson Society, that was another story we did, which is a neoconservative group which has for a decade been briefing against uh, WikiLeaks and Assange in the media. Um, that was the first story. We also looked to her son, um, who is, uh, uh, works for an investment um, uh, house that has invested heavily in something called Dark Trace, which was a... Um, a cyber security company which is basically to stop data leaks which was set up by GCHQ, the UK surveillance agency and MI5, the domestic security agency and then recruited personnel directly from the CIA and NSA. I mean these stories had no impact and in fact we've done, we did six um, recently and then 
Every single time I, I requested comment from Westminster Magistrates Court and the Ministry of Justice never got anything back. The final one we did recently, which was about the Henry Jackson Society, which I just referenced, we finally got a one-line comment from them saying, Lady Arbuthnot has not shown any evidence of bias, which does, didn't really answer my questions, but at least it was some sort of um, uh, response. Now, in that context, you kind of wonder when, when, when this is known about and nothing's been done about it, or not, there's not even any public acknowledgement or uh, official acknowledgement that it exists, you wonder what other um, conflicts of interest exist. And, and the fact is we don't have a press in this country that is looking into this case like it should be. If, I think if you had a, uh, basically declassified and a work myself and, and Mark Curtis have done on this, we're the, kind of the only journalists looking at the legal process around it, which is really mad when you think of the, the level of conflict of interest there is and the importance of the case. So, um, yeah, as I say, I don't know, don't know how this is going to play out, but Beresa herself is, is an example of, uh, uh, of the lack of transparency around the case because the story we did about her was... I applied to the Ministry of Justice through the Freedom of Information Act for a basic information about her. I wanted a case list, so every case she's ruled on and what the ruling was. Not, not, uh, nothing, nothing particularly um, detailed. And the Ministry of Justice rejected it and said it, vi it, it violated the uh, Constitutional Reform Act as well as data protection. I did the same request for a different judge who was appointed a, uh, a magistrate on the same day as her and they didn't reject it. So that tells you something. Uh, they, um, and then I did a parallel construction whereby I just used open source stuff to construct an extradition case list for her. I found 24 cases um, through Westlaw, which is a legal database, as well as Factiva, the, the media database. 24 cases, 23 of which she'd ordered extradition. So she's got a 96% extradition record based on publicly available information. So it doesn't look good when you think about that. Um, and and the, the work we've done has basically been ignored by the mainstream media, number one, um, and then obviously officials themselves, number two. But if the mainstream media became interested in the stories we're doing, and as I say, did investigations themselves, I think it could really change the game with this case. Because Ellsberg testified the other day, as we know, in the Pentagon Papers case, he, the government... Um, uh, malfeasance in that case they raided his psychologist office to try and get information to smear him in the media that got the case thrown out now if we can find out information which clearly shows that this case is 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 corrupted in some sense it would have a major impact and especially if it appears in the mainstream media because I think even if the stories we've done had appeared in say the Guardian or the Times it would have had a big national impact and maybe have changed things but I think that we, it's because they don't see Assange as a journalist. They don't see what's happening to him as a threat to them. And of course it is, because he is being, he's being, he's, he's in prison and he's, uh, the, the extradition is happening because he revealed information which is embarrassing to the US government. Now, that, if he gets extradited, that gives license to the US government to go anywhere in the world and pluck someone that they don't, because they don't like what they're publishing about them and put them in prison in a supermax. And that is terrifying. I mean, I know it's an overused word, but I think it is one step on the way towards fascism. And of course, it's been done by the Trump administration as well. And it's funny that all the resistance Democrats who uh, are, get upset about him being mean to reporters, which is fair enough, he's got an awful record on the media. They don't, it doesn't transpose over to Assange, when in fact, what he's doing to Assange and his administration and his DOJ is doing to Assange is the most grave threat to press freedom in history, because it will set a precedent that they can use against anyone. You're exactly right. Now, has the previous judge in this case, Lady Arbuthnot, has she formally recused herself in this case? That's a, a good question, and the answer is no. What she did, and it's all, as I say, being completely untransparent. Untra Basically, uh, uh, six months ago or so, they re uh, Westminster Magistrates Court released a statement to Private Eye magazine saying that she had stepped aside on the case, i.e. she wasn't ruling on it anymore. We did know at that point she wasn't ruling, but we'd never got official acknowledgement. But that was the first official acknowledgement, and it was only got because a reporter requested it. Um, and then since that, as I say, they haven't responded to any of my requests. And uh, in fact, it's an important distinction because if she recused herself, which is an official... Uh, admission of conflict of interest. One, it would mean that the defence could revisit the ruling she made in 2018, which I mentioned. And also it would, it would completely change her role in the case now, because just stepping aside allows her to maintain her mentoring, 
and uh, liaising role that she has with their junior judges, with Beresa on this case, which we, obviously we don't know anything about what their relationship on this case is, but it, there's no reason that it can't still exist. She just can't rule on it. So the difference between recusement and stepping aside is huge and has massive ramifications. And of course, if you look at the evidence and we've compiled thousands of words of it, she 100% has huge conflicts of interest across the board that means she should um, uh, recuse herself. Um, but it hasn't happened. And it really is, like so much of this case, a stain on the British judiciary. And when history is written, it's going to be a, a, an embarrassing uh, moment in, in, British, in the British judicial history, even if they don't uh, extradite him. All this, all, all, the whole record is just abysmal. Now, as an investigative journalist yourself, how will the outcome of this case impact your work? I think that a free, vibrant press is a cornerstone of democracy. So we can't let um, the powers that be undermine that central tenet of democracy by threatening people. And of course, this case is a threat to everyone. But we will carry on doing what we're doing. Of course, for many journalists, it will who don't have that um, uh, predilection, it will, it will soften what they what they do because people. Um, a lot of the, the this case is about uh, Assange's interactions with Chelsea Manning, and he is being extradited for basically helping her protect her identity, which is what, uh, as a journalist, you have a responsibility to help your source protect themselves from uh, the powers that they're upsetting by releasing the information to you, and that. So all sorts of source interaction for journalists will change after this or people will have to think about it in a very different way because it will criminalise effectively the reporting of national security issues because especially in the US because or around the world but when you're dealing with US um, um, uh, agencies and a, a good example is we published recently a, a, a really good uh, investigation about the CIA and MI6 um, their secret war in Kenya which became a big issue in Kenya. Um, it was published on, uh, got two front pages in the main, one of the main papers in Kenya. And in fact, if Assange gets extradited, that, that article contained things that essentially the CIA didn't like that, that, that were classified, which means that they could bring a case against that journalist just for publishing information they don't like if Assange gets extradited. So I mean, so much is riding on this and it should send chills through any investigative journalist around the world um, because if they get Assange, then they can get anyone. Okay, Matt Kennard, thank you.